Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number 12 of the War of the Jewels. And today we are going to talk about whither the withered Hurin is going. Um, so um, I've been asking, my the question I've been asking for the last couple of sessions, as we've been looking at the end of the Quinta and we were thinking about the lost apocalypse and everything, as we're thinking about, um, you know, just kind of where... Where things were going, basically, with the with the Quinta and stuff. My question was, what does Tolkien think he's doing, right? Um, how can we can we get a clearer sense as the thing develops, you know, as the work proceeded in the fifties on this revision of the Silmarillion? What in his mind did he imagine the published Silmarillion looking like, right? Um, you know, are we keeping the annals and the Quinta? Are we keeping the Quinta? You know, does he keep one and not the other? Does he keep them both? Is he planning to supplement that? If so, how, you know, how is this, what can we see? Um, what's the state of the frame? That seems to be potentially in a state of flux as well. Um, so we're going to be returning to that question at times, of course, as we go now into, you know, we're now in, um, you know, well entrenched in the wanderings of Hurin, which was the much longer text that he set himself to writing after he um, uh, after he began, uh, you know, or after he got to this point rather uh, in the Quinta. And my question for this section is not what does Tolkien think he's doing, but why, <laughs> why, why, why Hurin? Why, why are we doing this? Um, what does he have in mind? So, and I, when I say why, <laughs> when I send up a desperate and plaintive question of why, um, I, uh, I'm asking two things. First of all, um, is this, it does seem to me that it is, seems to be part, um, of the, um, does seem to be part of the, the Turin cycle. Right. That he has. Um, we know he's been developing. We're not getting that in these texts. Uh, right. Because it, because Christopher already published it in Unfinished Tales. So he's not including it here. But we know he's already done, um, you know, the text that he that that Christopher that Christopher is calling the Narn. Right. The expanded version of the Turin story, um, which was published first in bits. Right. Just the new bits. Right. In. um uh, in Unfinished Tales, and then was put together with the Silmarillion account into the one unified account in the children in the published Children of Hurin. Um, uh, so those were, um, we know that he was doing that, right? And this seems to be a following on to that. Um, what, but I, my question is why? Why? Why is he going back? And what is it about the wanderings of Hurin? What is it about this extra sort of leg of the story? He's already retold the Turin story and gone all the way up through. We've got their tombstones now, right? But he's going to continue past the tombstones, not just to the familiar point beyond the tombstones. That is the part that Christopher chose to keep in the Polish Silmarillion, namely the final meeting between Hurin and Morwin by the tombstone, which, of course, you know, you will have read in this and will have seen that almost word for word, that's the version of the account, right, that he's kept. So Christopher has mined the wanderings of Hurin for that account, right? We've got, we're getting the, the, the Hurin and Morwin thing. And then it just kind of stops. In the Children of Hurin, it pretty much simply stopped, right? In the Silmarillion, we get like, a very brief version of the Hurin narrative, right? Where Hurin, as far as we can tell in the published Silmarillion, goes from the site where Morwen died, right? From, from his children's tombstone where his wife is dead. And he goes from there to Nargothrond. And he kills Meme, takes the Naglamir with the Silmaril, and brings it to Doriath, Right, does the thing, casts it at Thingol's feet with scorn. Melian heals him, uh, and he presents it more respectfully, and then g goes off and takes a one-way walk into the ocean. Right, 
that's the version of the story that we get in the published Silmarillion. So now we come to see, right, as we're reading this, that although Christopher took that first bit, right, the bit about the meeting between Huron and Morwen, which, remember, we know from the earlier accounts, from the Annals accounts, that he was toying with lots of different possibilities there yet, right? We know that it's only emerged at this point because we he, he was still writing those versions, those horrible versions, remember, where Turin survived and met his mother later on, right? Where it was Turin who met Morwen instead of Hurin. Um, but, um, but anyway, yeah, so, okay. So he is, um, you know, so th that version seems to have just emerged here at the beginning of the Wanderings of Hurin. So Christopher saved that. But then he cuts out all the rest of this narrative. Christopher does, right? He doesn't include that in the published Silmarillion. Um, that's not primarily my question. My question is not principally, why didn't Christopher include it? Again, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm not trying to make it sound like I think Christopher did something wrong in not including it. My question is, this story meant something to Tolkien. I mean, he's sitting down and writing a long continuation of this story a long development of the story beyond the outline, right? Um, going back to the, the version of the story that was fullest and closest to this was the one from the Book of Lost Tales. Uh, that was one where Hurin did have a posse of dudes. He wasn't on his own in the published Silmarillion. He's apparently wandering. It's a solo adventure, right? Solo adventure of geriatric uh, uh, protagonist, right? Wandering about... Um, uh, killing geriatric dwarves, mono e mono, and then bringing, you know, uh, the Naglamir with Silmaril to Thingol. But um, uh, in the original version, in the Book of Lost Tales version, he had a whole posse and there was a whole thing and the whole battle in Doriath, right? It was, uh, it got real ugly. Um, and there was a whole curse laid on the treasure. It was an entire thing. He's going back not exactly necessarily to that, but he's going back in that direction. And again, why? What is it? What can we see in this story? And again, I'm not trying to read his mind. You know, I, we, we, of course, we're not going to be able to know exactly what Tolkien was thinking when he wrote it. When I ask the question why, um, what I mean is, what can we see in this story? What is this story interested in? What are the chief concerns of this story? Um, and therefore, what can we see? Um, what can we see about what um, what Tolkien is focusing on? Like what this story, we don't know what Tolkien was thinking about, but we can see what the story is interested in. Right. Um, and that gives us some interesting hints of the direction in which Tolkien was thinking, I think. Right. Um, the one thing which seems to me quite clear, um, and Christopher is going to allude to this in a slide or two, is that um, the uh, um, is that this kind of narrative is the kind of story that he wants to write. Right? I talked about this last time. How Christopher clearly loves the narrative range of the Quintus Omerillion. Right, that seems to. Be based on what he's writing, that would seem to me to be Christopher's favorite, right? Um, uh, even as evidenced by the fact that he privileges it by titling, you know, the main part of the published book, The Quintus Silmarillion, um, even though it's not all or even, I think, principally drawn from The Quintus Silmarillion at the end. Um, but in any case... Um, Clearly, he is settling into writing this kind of story, uh, the kind of story that the Narn was, right? That fuller, um, more, uh, more detailed, more immediate, more dramatic. Remember those words that Christopher was using last time. Uh, version of the story. This, the Wanderings of Hurin, the Wanderings of Hurin is clearly the kind of like the the genre of story that he seemed really interested in writing at this point. But what's, what I'm interested to see is, again, what is this story about? What are we focusing on? And what can we learn about what seems to be interesting, uh, what seems to be interesting Tolkien in this particular narrative? What does he dwell on? So, okay, let's see what we can do. Now, I don't recall exactly. Um, I was trying to remember, 
did we finish talking about this paragraph? I don't know. I Let's reread it, though, because it's a good way to start as well. And this is when he uh, when he does that initial outline. I know we began this passage. I'm not sure if we said everything about it, but let's just reread it to have it in our minds as we continue. Uh, so more likely is it that he was drawn thither to discover news of Turin, drawn to Nargothrond, of course. To Brethel he would not yet come, nor to Doriath. He went first seeking a way into Gondolin, and the friendship of Turgon, which indeed would have been great, but he found it not. His doom was unwilling, for Morgoth's curse was ever upon him still, and moreover, since the near knife, Turgon had expended every art upon the hiding of his realm. Now, of course, we did talk about his doom was unwilling. I remember that. It was then that Hurin finding, and then he stops, and we're told here the text stops abruptly, but on the same page, and clearly at the same time, my father wrote the following. Hurin goes to seek Gondolin, fails, passes by Brethel, and his anguish is increased. They will not admit him, saying that the Halethrim do not wish any more to become enmeshed in the shadow of his kin. But placeholder, new lord, gives the dragon helm to Hurin. His heart is hot against Thingol. Hurin's presumably not the new lord. He, passed, he passes it, Doriath, by, and goes on to Nargothrond. Why? To seek news, plunder. He had been an admirer of Felagund. News of the fall of Nargothrond came to sons of Feanor and dismayed Mithros, but did not at all displease Kelgorn and Curafen. But when the news of the dragon's fall was heard, then many wondered concerning its horde and who was the master. Some orc lord, men thought. But the dwarves of blank, how did Meme find it? He must come of a different race. Okay. Um, so again, the 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 thing I want to focus on right now as the immediate kind of uh, I want to focus on that penultimate paragraph there. <clears throat> Again, I know we did go over a bunch of these ideas last time, um, but notice, first of all, how he uses a new name. They will not admit him saying that the Halethrim, which was not the word that he used to use to describe these people. You can tell he's describing the people, right? The people of Haleth, um, the Halethrim, uh, because the R-I-M there at the end is what he does to describe the people of, right? Like the Gondolindrim um, and the Nargathrondrim, for instance. Um, but yes, it was Haladin. It was the, the Haladin was what they were called as a people before. But now he's calling them the Halethrim for reasons that will become clear as we move through. Um, but notice he does not, um, he does not know the name of the new Lord. Um, and this is a, so this is one thing that is particularly interesting to me, um, both in light of the narrative that we're about to get, but also in light of the published Silmarillion, because after the death of Haleth, we get the initial story of Haleth, right? When he redoes it and, um, you know, decides that Haleth is a woman and, um, develops her uh, rather strong and memorable story, right, as the leader of her people, leading them into Brethel. Once they get into Brethel, we hear very little of them. They take very little part in the narrative. Again, if all you had was the published Silmarillion, you would know comparatively little about them. You would know that they intermarried with the House of Hador and the House of Beor. You would, I mean, you'd know that from the genealogies, if nothing else, it's mentioned in the narrative briefly. I mean, it's not dwelt upon, but it's mentioned. Um, you would know, of course, the most you would know about them. Where you would hear about the most is during the Turin story, of course, um, when Turin goes to Brethel and takes refuge with the Haladin at the end, right? Um, so, but that's kind of it. You know, they play this sort of background role uh, in a portion of Turin's story, the end portion of Turin's story. Um, and we know how they get started with Haleth, who is awesome, at the beginning. But we get comparatively little about them in between. And almost nothing about them afterwards, after the death of Turin, I mean. Um, very few other than just passing references. So here... And, and though we spend, well, okay, I want to be careful. I was going to say we spend quite a bit of time in, uh, you know, with the other two peoples of the Adine. Well, we have to be careful about that. We spend a good time with Baron, right? 
Um, but we don't spend a great deal of time like in Ladros with the uh, with the House of Beor. Exactly. Be, but because of the Baron narrative, we feel that we know them a little bit better. Right. We get the story of the outlaw, you know, Bar, you know, Bari here uh, rescuing Finrod. And we get the story of Bari here and the outlaws. Right. And Gorlim, the unhappy. So we know so we're kind of familiar with them, even though we don't, you know, but still it's something like it's a good little chunk. And then they're kind of gone. So, you know, can't be blamed if we don't know more about their culture afterwards because it's pretty much gone. Um, the House of Hador, of course. We know more of, at least again, we know more of its people. We know Turin and we know Tuor and we know Hurin. And, you know, and, and so we, we, we get some of that. And of course, but notice how Tolkien has already invested a great deal more time in the House of Hador when writing The Children of Hurin. If you recall the Narn, um, so that is, you know, if you recall the first few chapters, um, maybe first 10 chapters or so, of the children of Hurin. Um, this is, um, you know, the part of Turin's youth, all the way from the the earliest chapters on Turin's uh, youth and the death of Lilith, right, all the way up through Turin's departure and going to Doriath. Um, we, you know, his friendship with Labadal. We see the time there with his father when, you know, before the near knife, we see the time to go off to the near knife and the, the way that the, you know, we, we, we get a, a bit of a taste of what it was like for them to be living near the elves and to be allied with the elves and, um, and the, the kind of, you know, the way in which that was part of their culture. And then, of course, we get um, the time after the near knife when the Easterlings come and um, and then, of course, we return there and we get to see the, the afterwards, you know, we get this sort of um, um, uh, the the sad version of the scouring of the Shire, right, where we don't go back and clean things up, but just set things on fire and leave again. Um, you know, Turin goes back home and finds his home wrecked, uh, just like Sam and Frodo does ex do, except all he accomplishes doing is just setting fire to it and then leaving again. Um, so, uh, but again, point is he's spent Tolkien, not Turin, Tolkien has spent much more time now with the house of Hadar, right? So he has done a lot of that imaginative work, that world building work. He's, he's written a narrative which lives in Dor Loman for a while, right? Um, and he's written a narrative with Bari here in the Outlaws, I'm primarily thinking of, that lives in Dorthonian with the House of Beor. But he's never really written a narrative, a full narrative, that lives in Brethil. Um, some at the end of the of Turin's story, right? That's the closest really we get. Even Haleth's story. Haleth's story is great, but it's great in the Quintus Silmarillion style, right? That is... Um, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, elegiac. I'm trying to remember Christopher's other adjectives, right? Like the all of those things that he said about how awesome the style of of the Quenta is. Yeah, it's it's like that. It's awesome in that way, right? Um, but we don't really get to know Haleth. We don't really get to know much about the culture of that people. We don't really know sort of what it's like, right? Um, and so one thing that we can already see in his, these are, you know, these last two paragraphs on this slide are his, his notes, right? His, his brainstorming um, of what he's going to do. And we can already see he's starting to write some story. He's, he's going in his mind. He's already going to breath Hill. Um, he, he seems attracted by the idea of going to breath Hill, right? Um, and I say he's attracted. The, the main thing that suggests to me that he is attracted to this and is planning to settle down there a little bit. He doesn't spend too long in, it, in this in this little um, outline, right? It's not that he, you know, is is going on and on about it. That sometimes happens, right? He'll write an outline and then he'll get carried away, and then pretty soon he's writing a whole narrative. That's not what's happening here, right? The thing that is most suggestive to me is the little carrot that he writes in the empty spot where the name of the new lord is supposed to be. Um, he 
that's a little placeholder, it seems. Christopher's interpretation, and I see no reason to doubt him. Um, Christopher's interpretation is that that little carrot means he's leaving a space where he's going to put whatever the name of the new Lord is going to be. And he knows where that story is going to go. But he's going to invent a name for that Lord. In other words, like that one little carrot in an empty space is like a kind of promissory note, right? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to fill in some blanks here with the Haladin. Um, oh, excuse me now, the Halethrim, right? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to develop that. Um, we got a taste for it with the Hurin, the Turin story, but the Turin story, even in its longer form, was so focused on Turin and on Turin and Niniel's relationship at the end, right? That we don't really learn much about that culture or about those people, right? But now it's time. Now it's time. Okay. Um, last comment on... Um, uh, from Christopher here before we really dig into the new narrative. Then little though Hurin trusted aught that Morgoth said or did, knowing that he was without pity, he took his freedom and went forth in grief, embittered by the deceits of the Dark Lord. Twenty-eight years Hurin was captive in Angband. Christopher's commentary. In this passage, my father was following, with some expansion, the continuation of the Grey Annals. From this point, he followed it almost without alteration, as far as, and with that, he departed and left the land of Hithlam. There were thus two closely similar... So, remember, the end of the passage, if we go back to that previous slide, right? The two paragraphs at the top there, that's the tail end um, of the narrative that we were getting, which was the... Con so, remember, he's writing the Grey Annals. And then he separates off the last seven pages, the last seven sheets of paper, right? And um, and puts them in a different drawer and loses them, <laughs> right? Loses track of them. Um, and that's why the Grey Annals ended so abruptly without the inscription, right? And then they carved nothing, right? That's why it ended like that. So, okay, so so that that's the that's what he's talking about. He's talking about that passage that he just finished, that we just finished getting, right? Um, so that was... Where he and 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 again, we had talked about how the way in which Tolkien separated those pages off, the pages which were the suggests that he was in his mind, he's saying, Okay, this is not going to be part of the Grey Annals, this is going to be a separate work. I want to do a whole story, I want to sit down and spend some time with the wanderings of Horn. I'm not just going to make it a, a, a series of entries in the annals. Remember, it began that way. I'm not going to make it a series of entries in the annals. I'm going to make this a whole story. This is going to be a whole thing, right? Like the Narn was a whole thing. Like uh, the, you know, the, the, the longer epic versions of his, uh, of his treatment, like the, you know, the alliterative children of Hurin or the uh, Lay of Lathian was a whole thing, right? I'm going to make it that kind of a, that kind of a thing, right? Okay, so he was following with some expansion the continuation of the Grey Annals, that, that seven-page section that got separated out. From this point, he followed it almost without alteration, as far as, and with that, he departed and left the land of Hithlam. There are thus two closely similar, and for the mo most of their length all but identical, texts of this short narrative, which may be called Hurin in Hithlam. But the first of them is the continuation of the annals, and the second is the opening of a wholly new story of Hurin in Brethel. Right? So, so again, so he takes those seven pages... And he doesn't just continue them. He reworks them, but follows it very closely, setting out on this new work that Christopher Tolkien is talking about. Causing a postponement of the story of Hurin and Nargothrond, which in the event was never reached. So again, he was planning to focus on Hurin and Nargothrond, but then he gets distracted, right? Funny thing happened on the way to Nargothrond. Hurin passed by Brethil. And Tolkien's like, yeah, we've got to go. We've got to go to Brethel. Seeing then that the second text of Hurin and Hithlam has an entirely distinct function, there is clearly no question of regarding the story of Hurin and Brethel as a further extension of the annals. Right? Love this clarification from Christopher. He's like, so don't make a mistake. Don't think that this whole wandering of Hurin thing is just like the 
we're still in the gray annals, that this is the end. It's not the annals. He is pretty clear on the fact that the separation of those pages and then the reworking and moving on through the story and developing the story of Brethel is clearly a different artistic project on Tolkien's part, not carrying on work on the annals. As will be seen, my father was very evidently no longer writing Annals of Beleriand. That work was now abandoned, or possibly in his intention, left in abeyance until the new story had been completed on the scale that he found congenial. So one way or other, whether he is uh, setting it aside temporarily, or whether he is ditching the concept of the Annals permanently, Christopher is not rendering an opinion on that question, right? Whichever way he's doing, he is setting it aside so that he can focus on this new book called, you know, The Further Misery of the House of Hador, right? Um, because the Children of Horin isn't depressing enough. You wanted a sequel, right? The people are crying out for a sequel. Some of us still have a will, a will to live, J.R.R. Tolkien. Would you please write a second book, a sequel to the Children of Hurin, um, that will finish all of us off uh, for good and all. Um, that anyway seems to be more or less... I'm not saying, by the way, that that's what he sees in the story and is in fact his goal. I'm just saying that's what he may have accomplished if he had in fact finished this, at least as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, uh, and I would just a little bit, um, a little bit of a note um, on until the new story had been completed on the scale that he found congenial. Um, remember that I've politely disagreed with Christopher uh, a couple times that I think that Christopher seems to be holding on to the idea of the Quenta, right, as the thing that Tolkien was going to, and I've been saying, I, I don't think so. Like, I think that the direction he was going in, I mean, he seems to have been, uh, this, I think, I, I agree with this, right? This is definitely, um, it's not just that he found this scale congenial for this particular story. I think it's, this is the kind of story that he seems to have really been focusing on writing. Um, but, um, Anyway, anyway, Arthur, the sequel would be called How I Met Your Mother. Man, like the sequel in this case would be called How I Buried Your Mother uh, or not, as the case may be. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I'm telling you, like, is there anything more depressing than the story of of uh, Hurin and his family? I don't know. Um, but um, anyway, OK. Now let's move on into the story. From Dorlomen you come, I am told, he said. But why you come, I know not. Little good has come to Brethel out of that land, and I look for none now. It is a fief of Angband. Cold welcome you will find here, creeping in thus to spy out our ways. Now this is not Hurin, this is Asgon, right? So Hurin has left them behind... He's brought his crew, Asgon and the, and, and the boys, right, uh, have come with him out of Dor Lomen. These are the, like, faithful members of the House of Hador that have been living as, like, uh, you know, desperados in the hills, right? I don't know if they're actually desperados. I just think that's a fun word. Um, uh, but they seemed a little desperado to me. So I, I guess uh, I, I think it kind of works. Anyway, they'd been living in the hills. Now, keep in mind, we d we have the obvious peril that we alluded to last time, but I want to make a little bit more explicit what seems to be not just the peril, but the anti-parallel. And of course, I'm thinking about... Um, I'm thinking about the peril between Turin and his band of outlaws and Hurin and his band of outlaws, right? Um, so it's not just like band of outlaws, the senior circuit, right? Um, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's, I think these are the ones that I was calling Hurin's not non-merry men uh, last time, his grim men. Um, but that he had, they are outlaws, right? But notice the difference. The outlaws that Turin takes up with are outlaws from the... They're out, they've been outlawed by the good guys, right? They've been outlawed, whether it's by Doriath, whether it's by the people of Brethil, right? They've been, that, those are the people whom they've been outlawed by, right? Um, and indeed, when Turin meets them, and when he be, even when he becomes their leader, um, they are not respectable, right? They are... Uh, they are robbing and murdering elves, humans, 
uh, just as as freely as orcs. It's not until Beleg comes and joins him that he changes his practices and says that he will not waylay any but, but the servants of the enemy. Um, so initially, in other words, Hurin's band of outlaws were outlaws for a reason. They're real sketchy characters. Um, Hurin begins in a in sort of a different place, right? I mean, if you think about the parallels, Turin was in Doriath, right? He was being fostered in Doriath uh, and went forth in shame, right, after killing a guy. Now, he was pardoned and everything, but he doesn't know that yet, or he believes himself to be in shame, uh, to be leaving in shame. So he's leaving in shame the 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 kingdom of a good king work with me when I call Thingol a good king. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm contrasting with Morgoth here, right? So hopefully we can agree that far. Anyway, he was, he was going forth in shame from a good kingdom, right? Uh, from under the supervision of a good kingly ruler who loved him like a son, right? Hurin is leaving, Angband is leaving the evil kingdom, right, after being under the personal supervision of the evil king who took a special interest in him and his family, right? Um, but he is going forth, Hurin is going forth from the evil kingdom in honor, not in shame, right? Apparently in honor. Um, enough to give Lorgan, the lord of the Easterlings of Dor Loman, pause, right, before killing him. Um, and I agree, James, in the tale of Turin, Thingol comes off better than he does elsewhere. It's true. It's a uh, um, it's a rare outside of the gray annals high water mark for Thingol's uh, story. But um, anyway, okay. Um, but you see that you see the little uh, anti parallel that I'm building there. And then what happens? Right then they get out into the you know they 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 go forth, the one in shame from the good kingdom. From, uh, away from the king who loves him, the one in honor, away from the evil kingdom, away from the evil king who hates him and whom he's been defying. And now they they go and they both gather about them a group of outlaws, right? Turin's outlaws are criminals uh, and murderers and rapists, and um, Hurin's are the downtrodden faithful of Dor Loman, who are only outlaws in the sense that they are outlaws to the Easterlings and servants of Morgoth, right? Um, they are, in a sense, the last, um, the last faithful, um, you know, members of the House of Hador, essentially, right? Um, okay, all right, so we've got... Um, so he seems to be building this again. Keep in mind, this is me just trying to answer the, my question: Why? Like, what is this story interested in? What is this story about? So that's one of the first things that I notice is that he seems to be at the beginning of the wanderings of Hurin, setting Hurin up as a kind of um, a kind of uh, a kind of anti-Turin in some way, right? Uh, at least his situation is notably inverted from Turin's position. So, all right. Okay, fine. Anyway, so he and his band of grim men um, go towards Gondolin, but not that far. Um, and then he ditches them. He leaves them behind and he goes on towards Gondolin himself. Now, presumably he does this for good reasons. We can think of lots of good reasons why he would ditch his grim men, um, not with the intention of ditching them forever. Um, but of course, not only can he not take them with him when he's trying to get back into Gondolin, um, but he's not even going to be able to let them. I mean, he can't leave a note and be like, um, hey, guys, uh, gone to look for Gondolin um, back soon. Um, you know, like he can't do that. He can't say that because, remember, it's a secret even that Gondolin is in this part of the continent. People generally think that Gondolin is way down in the south somewhere. 
because that would have been a pretty good place to build Gondolin, <laughs> to be perfectly frank, right? Um, makes a whole lot of, um, make would make a whole lot of sense. Um, okay, uh, so, um, great. He leaves them behind, but now they're confused and they don't know what to do. So they're going into Brethel, right? To see if, because they woke up and they misplaced Hurin. They're like, you know, where did you see him last? Let's retrace our steps. And um, in the end, um, uh, they go into Brethel looking for him. Okay, so that's who we're talking about. Asgon is their um, um, is their leader. Cold welcome you will find here, creeping in thus to spy out our ways. Asgon restrained his anger, but answered stoutly. We did not come in stealth, Lord. We have as great craft in woods as your folk, and we should not so easily have been taken if we had known any cause for fear. We are a dying, and we do not serve Angban, but hold to the house of Hador. We believe that the men of Brethel were of like sort and friendly to all faithful men. To those of proved faith, said Hardine, to be a dying is not enough alone, and as for the house of Hador, it is held in little love here. Why should the folk of that house come here now? To that, Asgon made no answer, for from the unfriendship of the master changed to chieftain, he thought it best not to speak yet of Hurin. I see that you will not speak of all that you know, said Hardang. So be it. I must judge as I see, but I will be just. This is my judgment. Here Turin, son of Hurin, dwelt for a time, and he delivered the hand, the land, sorry, he delivered the land from the serpent of Angband. For this I give you your lives. But he scorned Brondir, right chieftain of Brethil, and he slew him without justice or pity. Therefore I will not harbor you here. You shall be thrust forth whence you entered. Go now, and if you return, it will be to death. Okay. All right. So, um, first of all, so this is Hardang, the, the, this is the, this is the answer. This is the fill in the blank, right? He didn't have the name for the new Lord, right? Uh, here's his name, Hardang. Uh, this is, this is, this is the, uh, uh, the exalted heir of slain Brondir. Um, first of all, notice, uh, find this scene a little bit familiar, right? Seem to, um, uh, recall anything? Make you think of any other situation, right? It sure made me think of the meeting between Aragorn and Eomir in the Two Towers, right? Um, especially Asgun's first speech there. Um, we are a dine, and we do not serve Angban, but hold to the house of Hador. We believed that the men of Brethel were of like sort and friendly to all faithful men. Um, Asgon is, in my opinion, um, speaking with skill in a tight place here. On the one hand, he is being polite. He has not uh, spoken any insult or given any offense. Um, and yet he is speaking sternly, right? Um, we are a dine, and we do not serve Angban, but hold to the house of Hador. We believed, past tense, that the men of Brethil were of like sort and friendly to all faithful men. The way that that gets placed out there is in a, are you proving me wrong? Are you not friendly to all faithful men? That would make you unfaithful, wouldn't it? Right? We are a dine. Oh, that doesn't mean anything to you. Our allegiance of old, the kinship between our peoples. Right? Remember when we were all intermarried deliberately back then on the day of the double marriage? Right? That was kind of a big deal. Right? Um, uh, we remember this. We assumed you remembered this too. Right? Hardang's response to those of proved faith, he says, right? That is uh, uh, friendly to all faithful men, to those of proved faith. To be a dine 
is not enough alone. And as for the house of Hador, it is held in little love here. Um, yes, old alliances, uh, that's, um, old alliances are old news now in the new world, right? This seems to me to be one of the things that Tolkien is exploring. And it's a thing that, again, we get a little bit of, a taste for it in the Turin story. Not only what is the world like on the ground after the near or Noidiad, what is it like to live during the time after all of the elven kingdoms except for um, Gondolin, which remains hidden and isolationist. Um, th- yes, Doriath too, also remaining isolationist. But what is it like to live in Beleriand when all of the elf kingdoms that count um, have fallen? And these people are living in an island, right? I mean, Brethil is not yet overrun, um, but it can't be long, and they have little defense. Um, there's little that they can do once the enemy notices them, right? They're in a, it's, a, it's a hard world that they're living in, and Tolkien seems to want to imagine that hard world. We got that in, um, not just in the Turin story, but especially in the Narn as well. I spoke in the Narn. Um, it's a little bit hard. I know I keep making specific allusions to, like, the Children of Hurin stuff, and we haven't read the Children of Hurin together. Um, but in the... I talked about in the early chapters where he lets us live in Dor Lomen for a little bit, right? And live with the House of Hador and see what they were like and what their life was like. With Turin and the outlaws, we get to live in this world a little bit, right? First with the outlaws and then with the Haladin at the end, um, we get a glimpse of what this post um, near Nith or Noidiad world looks like. Right. First in this, the uh, the kind of every man for himself life that the outlaws were living, even the glimpses that we got of the woodmen um, who were the these men of Brethil, right, who were still trying to maintain their own defense and their own ways and, in a, you know, sort of their own safety and integrity um, while the rest of the world was um you know, breaking down around them, not just through orc invasions, but even through these outlaws who are like where women of those homesteads could not safely wander out on their own for fear of being captured and raped by men in the wilderness. Right. That's the world that he describes there, you know, here in the post near Nith or Arnodiad world. Um, and Turin, of course, is initially part of that world. And then later on, temporarily changing that world around him. Um, and then, of course, again in Brethil, at the end of the Turin story, we can see there is some security there, but there's a constant threat of, uh, of orc invasion, and um, there's battle on the frontiers as the people on the inside where Turin is with Nino, um, you know, I, I, and there's this sort of illusion of, of safety and seclusion there. But we know from Dorlas and others that there's continual battle out, you know, at the um, at the fords and the crossings of, of, of Tiglin and everything. Um, so, um, so again, Tolkien seems interested, curious um, to um, to explore, to show what was that world like? What you know, I, he describes it right. He gives the parameters for it. But again, this is where I'm coming back to Christopher's phrase about telling the story in a in a mode that is more congenial to him. Um, he's not content anymore just to give the kind of Quintus Silmarillion overview, right? Just to kind of wave his hands and be like, "Yep, everything was miserable in Beleriand right now." Now he wants to come in and be like, oh, no, in what way is it like, what does it look like to be right in the misery? 
Um, <laughs> this is why I come back to why, why this, there's so many happier times you could have told about, but he really, um, he really is interested in exploring that. So again, and I think that the way that this, that he is exploring this here is, um, uh, I think it is, um, it shows a really interesting progression of that story and of the sort of building and development of that world. Hard dying here is hard. Um, he does not give them the welcome that they expect, but he's also not at this point yet truly unreasonable either. Um, to those of proved faith, to be a dine is not enough alone. That's, um, is that, uh, is that too hard? Is there any justification for that? Remember the caution about people who escape from Angband, right? That often welcoming people who escape escape or appear to escape out of Angband is often a really bad idea, right? Um, to shut out an escaped prisoner seems horrible, but it's also often the right thing to do. I mean, like, it's, it's hard. It's a, it's a, he is depicting a world of difficult choices. And the thing that I find so interesting about the story that we're looking at here tonight is that he seems to be wanting to explore what happens. These are good societies. These are good societies that are built at least in the midst of the Elvish kingdoms, in some cases in direct community with the Elvish kingdoms, like in Dorloman. Um, what happens to those communities? What happens to those cultures as times begin to get desperate? And these are very desperate times. Um, now, Hardang saying, and as for the house of Hador, it is held in little love here. That's a little bit more of a, to me, a little bit more of a red flag, right? Um, understood. Uh, look, it's, um, it's not hard to understand anybody who's having a little bit of post-Turin burnout. Right. Um, I understand Turin is a lot, right? He's kind of extra. And uh, he came and did lots of extra things in both directions. Um, on the one hand, Turin, son of Hurin, was a hero who delivered the land from the Serpent of Angband. That's a really big deal, right? He, that is Glaurung was heading to Brethil to destroy the lot of them and would certainly have been able to destroy their exceptionally flammable society. Um, and yet, um, he, Turin, also, in addition to delivering them from that very certain danger, um, from that uh, almost guaranteed destruction, um, first dissed and then slew their chieftain, which is not a good look. Um, therefore, I will not harbor you here. You shall be thrust forth whence you entered. Go now, and if you return, it will be to death. The distrust. Notice the, the sort of both the immediate and the historical grounds for distrust that Hardang mentions. First, historically, right, Turin was, to say the least, a mixed bag, right? And we are not going to risk that, right? Um, uh, you guys have a checkered history. But also, there is cause for distrust immediately. To be a dine is not enough alone. How do we know that we can trust you? We can't just say we're all good guys together anymore because that's not... Hardang seems to suggest that that's not the world that they live in anymore. 
Uh, but as they were hailed from the hall, Asgon cried, This is the justice of Eastrons and not of Edain. We were not here with Turin, either in good deed or evil. Hurin we serve. He lives still. Lurking in your wood, do you not remember the near knife? Will you then dishonor him also in your spite if he comes? If Hurin comes, do you say, said Hardang? When Morgoth sleeps, maybe. Nay, said Asgon, he has returned. With him we came to your borders. He has an errand here, he said. He will come. Then I shall be here to meet him, said Hardang, but you will not. Now go. He spoke as in scorn, but his face whitened in sudden fear that some strange thing had happened, boding yet worse to come. Then a great dread of the shadow of the house of Hador fell upon him, so that his heart grew dark, for he was not a man of great spirit, such as were Hunthor and Menthor, descendants of Hiril. Asgon and his company were blindfolded again, lest they should espy out the pathways of Bretho, and they were laid back, led back to the North March. Ebor was ill-pleased when he heard of what had passed in Obel Halad, and he spoke to them more courteously. Okay, notice what is... Notice what's going... There's so much going on here. Um, several things really jump out at me in this passage. One, um, let's start with the, the end. First, just notice big picture. Notice the world building he's doing. Notice how even here he's fleshing out the story of the Haladin more, right? Um, remember in the Turin story, if you remember the Turin story from the published Silmarillion, Hunthor, who gets mentioned here, remember Hunthor? He's the one who gets his face smashed in by the rock um, when he's climbing up with Turin uh, to the underbelly of Glaurung when he goes along with him, and then uh, he, Glaurung, starts crossing over uh, above their heads and he dislodges a stone and it bashes in Hunthor's head and he falls into the river and dies. Um, and thus perished, you know, not the least valiant. Remember that? Remember that? Um, that business? So Hunthor, really minor character in the Turin story. Um, I mean, you know, he has a good run, brief though it is, right? And he gets named. He, it, it's it's a little bit like a red shirt. It's kind of exactly like a red shirt uh, uh, position. It's a pretty cool red shirt position. Like he's not one of the red shirts, uh, you know, in Star Trek who just like gets shot from a distance at the very beginning, right? Or does something stupid and then dies as a consequence. Um, rather, he's somebody who really shows up and um, but doesn't make it, you know, doesn't doesn't survive to the end. Um, and he did get a speaking role, Feanaro, exactly. So, um, you know, it's um, uh, it's a it's a it's a big deal. Um, but notice how much of a bigger deal he's become here. Uh, the idea Hunthor was Brandir's kinsman, right? We were known that. Um, you know, we, we were, we were, we knew that. Um, but that's all we knew about him, right? That he was a volunteer. Turin called for volunteers. Hunthor volunteered. Hunthor, who was a kinsman of Brondir. Um, so I guess it. Little, like, bit, piece of background for a red shirt character in the Turin story. His role grows a little bit when Tolkien comes back to it in the Narn. Um, but now, now he's becoming a whole thing. He was not a man, that is, uh, Hardang, was not a man of great spirit, such as were Hunthor and Menthor, whom we've also met, the captain on the, on the marches, right? Um, descendants of Hiril. Who's that? No idea. I mean, we learn eventually. But, um, but she's not in the published Silmarillion. Right. Um, he's not just inventing genealogy. He is inventing genealogies, but he isn't just inventing genealogies. Right. Um, now there's this whole story. See the story that begins to take shape. The Haladin, the people of Haleth have now. And we saw it beginning to happen with Brandir, um, who couldn't lead them. Right. Uh, and uh, played a sort of tragic role in the Turin story. Um, but. Um, but anyway, so here he, um, uh, 
now he has this, there's this like split, right? There are some of the, there are still some descendants of the house of Haleth, right? Some, you know, uh, of the line of Haleth who are still heroic and noble people of great spirit. Um, but not all of them are right now. There's this, uh, there's this sort of like degradation among the leadership. Um, and we're beginning to get this, um, almost, it feels a little bit worm tonguey, right? It's not quite worm tongue yet. It's, um, um, I, a, a little worm tongue ish, maybe would be a better way to say it. Um, right. But it's, um, uh, we're beginning to see, we get a glimpse of the political situation where the ruling chieftain, Hardang, is not one of the, one of great spirit, right? There are others whom people respect more, but he's not, a, but they're not of the direct lineage. Like we have the seeds of a possible civil war here in breath. We don't know if that's going to happen, right? But it could happen, right? He's, we're beginning to develop this story, and Har and Hardang is becoming already the sort of poster child of the post near knife children of Brethil, and by extension, the post near knife life in Beleriand among the people who used to be part of the alliance, right? Um, so, um, Yeah, again, just little glimpses of that. Um, notice even also that they're being called chieftain. That's interesting. That's significant, I think, um, that they should be called chieftain, not king. Um, or even lord. Hurin was lord of Dor um, Not king, because he was serving the high king. Um, okay. But um, uh, what else? What else is going on here? Um, the concerns about... So um, Asgon tries at the beginning to contrast the Eastrons and the Edain. Um, this is the justice of Eastrons and not of Edain. What does that mean? What is the justice of the Eastrons? Um, yeah, you could say, well, the justice of the Eastrons is um, um, injustice, right? Like, that's just a way of saying that is not just. And yes, it's true. But again, what he's, he's saying, Hardang, you are acting like an Easterling lord, not like one of the Adain. Um, in what sense? How? Of given the rest of his speech here, how does he, what, what similarity between his treatment at the hands of Hardung and his treatment at the hands of the Easterlings? And remember, Asgon is the you know the head of the Grim Men who were uh, living in the hills. You know they've been running away from the Eastron. They they know what the justice of the Eastrons is like, right? This is not just uh, this is not merely um, you know a sort of a stereotype from a distance. Um, so what does he say? We were not here with Turin either in good deed or evil. Hurin we serve. Right? So he's like, first of all, you're the Turin. Th who cares? Right? Yeah. Okay. If we're not here with Turin, we didn't have anything to do with Turin. Um, if you're going to say, I'm going to assume everybody from the house of Hador is bad because Turin was bad, you're being on, that is not the justice of the Adain. Um, that kind of, that kind of behavior, that kind of ruling, that's the kind of arbitrary. So like the arbitrariness of ruling, like I'm just going to rule by, um, you know, by prejudice and generality rather than giving the benefit of the doubt, rather than considering first, um, you know, like who you are and where you came from and, and what, um, that seems to be one element of what he's saying there. Hurin we serve. He lives still. Lurking in your wood, do you not remember the near knife? This is another way, of course, in which the Eastrons and the Edain differ, apparently. Um, first of all, 
that little insult, right, lurking in your wood. Um, have you forgotten? While you've been busy lurking here, have you forgotten the near knife? Will you then dishonor him, Hurin, also in your spite if he comes? Like, surely you remember the heroism of Hurin of Dor Loman, right? Do you not? The near knife was a long time ago now. It was 28 years ago, but um, surely you remember it. Surely you have heard the story. Surely you know what Hurin did in the near knife. Um, we're serving him. Why are you going on about this other stuff? Um, does that mean nothing to you? Um, and if that doesn't, what does? Right? And that's sort of the question that we can bring, I think, to Hardang and his words. What does matter to him? If not loyalty to old loyalties, right? You are to be of the Adain is not enough anymore, Hardang says. So what, what does matter? Um, expediency, right? Expediency of the moment. Um, what have you done for me lately, right? What benefit can I get from you or, you know, what uh, danger might I possibly imagine that you could be and I'm not going to take any chances? That's the, that's Hardang's world, right? Um, which is not the world of the Adain. Um, just looking out for themselves, right? Um, is, uh, I guess, maybe that's how the Eastrons act as well, according to Asgon. But of course, the final thing that we can see, well, the final thing, the final thing I'm going to talk about that we can see in this passage is the business about the shadow of the House of Hador, which is really interesting. Um, his face whitened in sudden fear that some strange thing had happened, boding yet worse to come. When, when Asgon promises, it sounds like a prophecy that Hurin will come. He has returned. With him we came to your borders. He has an errand here, he said. He will come. That freaks Hardang out. Some sudden fear that some strange thing had happened boding yet worse to come. Oh no, this might actually be a sign. This guy might actually be foretelling the future. And that might be horrible. Why does it why might it be horrible? Then a great dread of the shadow of the house of Hador fell upon him, so that his heart grew dark. Is Hardang's problem that he's forgotten the near knife? No. That is not his problem. He remembers the near knife. And what's worse, he remembers what happened after the near knife. He knows that the house of Hador in general and the family of Hurin, and Hurin and his family in particular, have been cursed by Morgoth. And Morgoth and Morgoth's ill will is the ruling reality of the world that Hardung lives in, right? The shadow of the house of Hador. Um, and I love the kind of, that phrase could mean a couple different things. A, a dread of the shadow of the house. He hasn't even seen the house of Hador, right? Like Hurin is not even there. So in one, in, in one sense, he's dreading the shadow of it in the sense that he's dreading even like the rumor of its approach, right? So this is like this, the, the depth of his dread, the depth of his foreboding. But of course, it also literally is referring to the shadow that has been placed upon the house of Hador by Morgoth, right? Morgoth's evil malice has focused itself in determined curse on Hurin. I want that guy nowhere near my kingdom because he is bringing with him the attention of Morgoth himself, right? Notice Hardang's first response to the do you not remember the near knife is skepticism. If Hurin comes, when Morgoth sleeps, maybe, right? Oh, yeah, I'm sure Hurin's just going to break out a prisoner, you know, and come wandering down here to Brethel. He doesn't believe him, right? Then the assurance, then the prophecy, and then the terror. Oh, man, that has to be bad. That absolutely has to be bad. Um... 
Yeah, ironically, he did fall asleep, JJ, as you say, but uh, that's not when Hurin escaped, because, of course, it was before Hurin was captured, unfortunately. It was an ill-timed nap on Morgoth's part, as far as Hurin was concerned. Um, yeah. Um, then we're, blind f we're blindfolded and let out, and notice Abor of, you know, one of the March Wardens, notice his reaction. He is ill-pleased when he heard of what had passed in Obel Halad, and he spoke to them more courteously. We see that division. There's a division in the in the in the bre in the society of the Haladin and Brethel, right? Um, there are those who are of great spirit, descendants of Hero. There are Hunthor like folks there still, um, who clearly do find it enough that Asgon and the others are a of the Adain, who want to honor their old, who want to think like they used to think in the old days, act like they used to act in the old days. And then there's Hardang, of whom they disapprove. Clearly, he disapproves. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, here's Christopher with some notes uh, explaining the Haladin thing. It also appears from C, that is manuscript C, that a new conception of the social organization of the men of Brethel had entered, and with it a new meaning of the name Haladin. Manthor is said to be one of the chief warriors and of the kin of the Haladin, and that many had wished to elect him warden. In this connection, an isolated note written on the reverse of that, uh, of that on the relationships of Turin referred to on page 268, states, The title of the chieftains of Brethel should not be lord or master. They were elected from the family of Haldad, called the Haladin, that is, wardens, for Hala in the old tongue of Beor's house and Haldad's, uh, uh, Haldad's watch guard. Sorry, for Hala in the old tongue of Beor's house and Haldad's equals watch guard. Halad was a warden. Haldad equals Watchdog. These new conceptions appear in the revision A2, where Hardang is said to have been made Halad, being of the Haladin, the kin of Halath, from which all chieftains were chosen. It is also said, following the discussion in C, that Hardang was no friend to Manthor, who was also of the Haladin. In contrast, in the first form of the passage, Haranthor is called the new master of the Haladin, where Haladin clearly still means the whole people. So, um, what does all this mean? Um, this is, uh, we can see the ideas developing about what is going on in Brethel and how it all works, right? And as is so typical, it begins with Tolkien, it begins with language, right? It begins with the words. Um, Haladin, the Haladin was the name for the whole people, Right. But he then begins to think about that word. Well, okay, so hala, hal, what does hal mean in their original language? Well, in their original language, hal means watch. So a halad is a warden. And so haldad's original name, like his name actually means watchdog. That was, so um, um, haleth is uh, the daughter of watchdog, right? Okay. Um, Haldad, by the way, now like um, jumps near the very top of my list of excellent Tolkien dog names. If you want to name your dog, right? Um, to name your dog Haldad would be a very Tolkien thing to do, right? Both because you would be taking that name from Tolkien appropriately and because you would be naming your dog Dog, which is just what Tolkien would do, right? That's how Tolkien naming conventions work. Um, so that's um, that would that, that Haldad would be an excellent dog name. Um, in retrospect, it would have been a particularly funny name for my dog. Um, uh, naming a a Shih Tzu watchdog, N naming a dog watchdog, um, who will immediately go up and start licking the ankles of whoever comes into the house, would be pretty comical. Um, but, um, anyway, um, so, so, so he's taking the name Hal, uh, Haladin, right? And he's saying, okay, no, 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 we're going to change this. 
um, cause I'm figuring out what this word means and I'm gonna, uh, uh, so now the Haladin are not the people as a whole. The Haladin are now the descendants of Haldad. Um, and it becomes a title. They're the wardens, right? Warden is his title. Notice why that should be. Why should the descendants of Haleth be called the Haladin, the wardens? Because that's what they agreed to do. That's when that's the deal they made when they were given the forest of Brethil. They were made the wardens of that particular march, and they were told to guard the crossings of Taglin, right? Um, that was the deal with Thingol that, um, for which he permitted them to stay in Brethil, which he couldn't very easily prevent as it was outside the girdle of Melian anyway. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, you, so it, it, this is, it, it, it's, it's now become a title. And of course, to Haleth, no doubt, uh, a particularly honorable title, because in her language, it recalls the name of her father. Um, you know, they are the watchmen, they are the guardians, they are the wardens of that region, like her father, Haldad, the watchdog. Um, so, okay, cool. That's all good. That works out. Um, but now we, we now he so that's where the Halethrim, I think, comes in because he can't he can't use the Haladin now. Um, but notice, boy, that's a that's a mouthful, Scott. The Brethel dream. Yeah, uh, sort of, <laughs> sort of. Um, but in any case, they're not the Haladin anymore. But again, notice the political thing that he's doing, right? Um, the the tension between Manthor and um, Hardang, right? Um, they're both of the Haladin. They're both descended from Haleth. Um, uh, and so we have drama impending. Anyway, let's keep going. Hurin has his moment. This is the other moment, of course, where a shortened version of it makes its way into the published Silmarillion, right? When Hurin wanders out and yells at the mountains, right? Calls out to Turgon, asking him to remember the Fens of Sarek um, and uh, spies of Morgoth over here, right? And thus uh, uh, Morgoth figures out in what part of the continent Gondolin is, right? Um, so um, we, we got that part. Um, again, one of the one of the parts that Christopher used in the published Silmarillion. But what we did not hear, again, in the published Silmarillion, Hurin wanders from there straight down to the, um, you know, to the to the towards Nargothrond. Instead, he ends up by the crossings and is found by the March Wardens. It was a man named Sagroth who first saw him, and he looked at him in wonder and was afraid, for he thought he knew who this old man was. Come, he cried to the others that followed. Look here, it must be Hurin. The incomer spoke truly. He has come. Trust you to find trouble as ever, Sagroth, said Forehend. The Halad will not be pleased with such findings. The Halad, right, the chieftain. The warden. What is to be done? Maybe Hardung would be better pleased to hear that we have stopped at the stopped the trouble at his borders and thrust it out. Thrust it out, said Avronk. He was Dorlas's son. Boo. A young man short and dark, but strong, well liked by Hardung, as his father had been. Thrust it out? Of what good would that be? It would come again. It can walk all the way from Angband if it is what you guess. See? He looks grim and has a sword, but he sleeps deep. Need he wake to more woe? Added, if you would please the chieftain forehand, he would end here. Such was the shadow that now fell upon the hearts of men as the power of Morgoth spread, and fear walked far and wide, but not all hearts were yet darkened. 
"'Shame upon you!' cried Manthor the captain, who coming behind had heard what they said. "'And upon you most, Avrunk, young though you are. "'At least you have heard of the deeds of Hurin of Hithlam, "'or did you hold them only fireside fables? "'What is to be done indeed? "'So slay him in his sleep is your counsel? "'Out of hell comes the thought.' "'And so does he,' answered Avrunk. "'If indeed he is Hurin, who knows?' Um, an apt rejoinder by uh, the villainous Avrunk. Um, out of hell comes the thought, and that dude comes straight out of hell, too. He's not wrong. Yeah, he's not wrong about that. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so that interjected sentence at the beginning of that um, that long paragraph is the one that jumps out at me most. See how he's setting this up? Such was the shadow that now fell upon the hearts of men as the power of Morgoth spread and fear walked far and wide. Um, he's referring, of course, to the conversation that just we are clearly supposed to be shocked and appalled by this conversation, right? I mean, it goes from not awesome to really horrible, right? We get three reactions. First, Sagroth, who just says, hey, look, it's probably Hurin, right? Asgon and the other dudes said that Hurin was coming, and look, here he is. It's Hurin. Now, we don't know what Sagroth is saying, if he, what he's suggesting, what he would want to do with Hurin, but he at least notices that he's there. Then Forehand wonders what is to be done, thinks the Halad, the warden, is not going to be pleased, and that it would be better to turn Hurin back at the borders, right? That's pretty bad. And Katriana, I was constantly thinking of the Avonk lizards in Lotro while reading this whole section. Um, especially because it was um, seemed quite apt, right? Uh, <laughs> I've... Um, yes... Uh, Av the Avronk character in this story uh, has a face somewhat like uh, an Avonk. If you if if you don't play the Lord of the Rings online, um, Avonk the Avonk um, is a like an alligator like uh, lizard um, uh, that you fight in various places. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yes, Alyssa, you're right. It is a reference to the two towers. We can't shoot an old man at unawares, right? Exactly. The um, we see again and again. Um, think even of the um, the reluctance of Faramir to kill uh, Gollum, right? The uncertainty as to whether or not they should shoot, even though he seems to be some kind of orc creature, as far as they can tell, who has come unbidden to their secret place. I mean, it's they have all kinds of reasons to shoot him on sight. And Faramir is clearly sufficiently unwilling to do that, that he brings Frodo out, you know, to inspect and such. Um, but, um, yeah, so the way and the, the, the assumption that we see throughout the Lord of the Rings, I mean, I, you know, Aemir would not, um, you know, Aragorn would not trap even an orc with a falsehood. Um, that just, you, you, you can't imagine this. You can tell the people who are honorable, anyone who is willing to act in this kind of way. I mean, even that they would deny him hospitality like this, that they would deny to anyone hospitality. Um, a, an old man found, you know, come, be warm, says Aragorn to Saruman, uh, right, when he sees him in the woods, presumably. Um, uh, yeah, the idea that they would even contemplate, even that they would contemplate not giving hospitality shows, boy, are we in a, a strange world compared to Rohan, compared to Gondor. But that Evronk would actually suggest, not only suggest killing him in his sleep, but would say that that's the thing that would please the chieftain. That the, those are the values in Brethil now? That's how we go on down here? Um, 
And so, you know, the narrator kind of shaking his head. But it's also, I don't go so far as to say an excuse. He's not exactly excusing it. But he is explaining it, right? Such was the shadow that now fell upon the hearts of men as the power of Morgoth spread and fear walked far and wide. As the power of Morgoth spread, I'm not sure how we're supposed to take that. And of course, remember, such was the shadow that now fell upon the hearts of men. Remember the terror that Hardang himself felt at the shadow of the House of Hador, right? Um, is he implying that there is a sense in which the will of Morgoth is actually at work among them? Fear walks far and wide. That might be enough to understand it or to explain it. Um, but what does it mean? But those two things, the power of Morgoth spread and the shadow now fell upon the hearts of men in the context of a story about Hurin, right, who bears the shadow and curse of Morgoth upon him and his eyes from afar. Can we know that the will of Morgoth is not at work here? Again, we have the example of Wormtongue, through whom the will of Saruman was at work in Rohan. Is this another version of a similar thing? Is the will of Morgoth um, at work here, right? Anyway, so I think it's an interesting question, but Monthor the captain stands against it. Shame upon you. Um, so slay him in his sleep is your counsel. And then again, out of hell comes your thought. Might it, actually? Is that the problem? Has, um, has, has Manthor put his finger on it, actually? Did that thought, in fact, come out of hell? Um, and again, I think that, like, the doubt, the uncertainty... Remember, this is one of the main things, I think, that Tolkien is kind of playing with. Um, let me explain what I mean by playing with. Um, if you've read Oedipus Rex, you know that part of the, in as much as that story is any fun, part of the fun of that story is, and fun might not be the greatest word to use of the story, Oedipus Rex, but um, the whole games with cause and effect there, right? Um, why do the things that happen happen? Is it because of destiny or is it because of choice, right? Um, you can see this constant emphasis is being placed upon the prophecies that were made in advance and how everything that was foretold is inexorably coming true. But at the same time, there is continual emphasis on the fact that the people involved all made all of the critical choices, that everything that is happening is due to very clearly and explicitly a product, a result of the particular choices that they have made, right? So there's this, um, you know, constant uh, sort of cognitive dissonance, right? As you're sort of asked to hold those two things together and, and try to, you know, you're kind of invited, like, what do you think? How do you feel about this, right? Where do you, you know, you're just kind of left to contemplate this question of uh, fate and free will. And to some extent, I have always felt that the Turin story does a very similar thing, right? Um, is it the curse of Morgoth? Is that what's going on here? Is that what's causing the trouble, the curse of Morgoth? Or is it, um, is it not? Is it, uh, is it Turin's choices? Turin's a pretty bad chooser. He makes a lot of really bad choices, and we can clearly see how his really bad choices lead directly, um, uh, uh, lead directly to um, the really bad outcomes that come. Right, but Morgoth's curse is also involved. Right. Um, anyway, so I, I feel like there's there's that same kind of doubt, that same kind of question. When he mentions the shadow and he talks about the shadow, um, 
Is he again? Is he extending that? Is that one of the things that he's still interested in? Is that the, possibly one of the answers to my why question? Is he writing the story of the wanderings of Hurin because he hasn't finished working that out? That he wants to explore, like, Curse of Morgoth, non-Turin version, right? Is that, um, is that what's, um, is that what, in part, anyway, what's happening here? I wonder. Um, okay, let's keep going. Whoop. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a, a whole lot of passages I wanted to do, but I know we couldn't do the whole thing, so I'm kind of jumping around. Um, but, um, but yeah, Emily, that's exactly right. Do prophecies cause the bad things to happen, or do they just foretell that your stupid choices will result in the bad things happening? And then, of course, Emily, there's that other level of cause and effect, like, was knowing about the prophecy the cause of the decision that you made? And if you hadn't known about the prophecy, you wouldn't have made the... This is Oedipus Rex all over, right? Um... Uh, yeah, yeah, I know that's exactly, that's exactly it. And we know, like, um, we have good reason to believe that the will of Morgoth is operative, that the shadow of his malevolent will is a real thing and really can impact stuff. But if so, how? And you know, where and what are the limits of that? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, as I said, there were lots of passages I wanted to talk about and I had to be, I had to restrict myself. Uh, so I picked some of my favorites. Uh, here's Menthor coming to the prison to speak to Hurin after he's chucked in jail after um, uh, <laughs> throwing a stool at um, Hardung's face. Pause for a second. Just notice again? Didn't that seem like a pretty conspicuous crime for him to commit? Don't you think? Right? Notice what we get again. Turin is insulted at the dinner table by one of the king's counselors, and he picks up a golden cup, which he has because he's sitting in a place of honor at the king's seat, right? And so he takes up a symbol of the honor that he is given by the king, namely a big, weighty um, golden cup with some pretty good heft, right? And he throws it in the face of Orgoth, a.k.a. Cyrus, um, and bashes his face in with it. And this is a crime which leads him to be to exile himself because he refuses to go quietly into custody. He's going to be taken into custody um, by the king, but he refuses to go to prison. Whoop, sorry. He refuses to go to prison and instead uh, goes off on the lam, leading to the whole outlaws parallel that we were looking at before, right? What happens here to Hurin? Hurin comes before the king uh, and is given a seat of dishonor, right? He's not only, he's not only given a seat of dishonor, he's given a seat of insult, right? Um, Turin's action, that is of throwing the drinking vessel in the face of Orgoth, is seen to be... Uh, now I know it's not just the drinking vessel in the face. Um, though remember, I think in the early version of the story, if I'm recalling correctly, he actually succeeds in killing him with a gold cup to the face. Um, which, if you've ever held a gold cup in your hand, you can easily... <laughs> those suckers are heavy, right? Uh, you you really you really wind up. I'm sure you could easily kill somebody with a golden cup to the face. But in any case, um, then, of course, in the later version, it gets complicated more by the, you know, or or Orgoth slash Cyros ambushes him later, and then, um, you know, Turin... Humil beats him and humiliates him and and uh, and then he runs off a cliff and that's uh, you know in, in, you know Magor's right there and everybody's embarrassed. Anyway, point is back to Hurin, right? So Hurin is given a seat of dishonor, picks up the symbol of his dishonor, namely the stool that he's been given to sit on in the king's in the lord's presence, and he throws the stool 
into the face, not of the king's advisor, but of, of not of the Lord's advisor, but of the Lord himself, right? And bashes the Lord in the face, at which point he is found guilty, right? Uh, uh, is, is seized, imprisoned, uh, uh, right? He's thrown into jail and sentenced to death, which is just what Turin thought he would do. Okay, so you see how, once again, there are parallels, between Hurin's story and Turin's story, but it's also almost mirror reversed, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so you're saying you've not held a golden cup in your hand before? I think I did once. I can't remember where I was. I feel like it was a like something being handed around in a museum. At some point, at some point, that I, anyway, I don't remember. But don't worry, JJ, it wasn't my personal gold cup. Um, but uh, yes, exactly. Those of us in the lucrative profession of, uh, yeah, of nonprofit education, um, you know, know everything about drinking out of golden cups, obviously. Um, but um, anyway, okay. But, but anyway, you see the parallel again, right? So once again, we have Hurin. Walking a path that is similar to Turin's path. Similar, but also very, very different. Because, of course, like, and he's going to be exonerated. Turin was pardoned, right? He was also, there was a, there, there was a trial. Turin had a trial. He wasn't there, but he had a trial, right? Um, even with a dramatic witness, of course, in the Narn version. Um, you know, a near... Uh, condemnation and then the a dramatic last second witness and and everything else right the whole courtroom scene uh there was a whole courtroom scene in the narn um with the testimony of the first elf lady who falls in love with Turin of the several uh but anyway okay um what else did i want to say um Oh, anyway, not even read anything. Let's read the actual passage. So he's in jail after chucking the stool at um, Hardang's head. When he had sent out his messengers, Manthor went to Hurin's prison. Remember, he sent out the messengers in order to gather the folk moot together. We're going to have a folk moot, um, which sounds, I'm not going to lie, our moots are more fun than this moot. I'm just, I'm going to come right out and say it. Signum moots, more fun than being on a trial for your life in front of the people of the Halethrim. Um, but it's kind of clunky as a, you know, marketing slogan, so we're probably not going to use that, but it's still true. Anyway, okay. When he had sent out his messengers, Manthor went to Hurin's prison, and the guards would not let him enter. Come, said Manthor. You know well that it is our good custom that any prisoner should have a friend that may come to him and see how he fares and give him counsel. The friend is chosen by the prisoner, the guards answered. But this wild man has no friends. He has one, said Manthor, and I ask leave to offer myself to his choice. The Halad forbids us to admit any save the guards, they said. But Manthor, who was wise in the laws and customs of his people, replied, No doubt, but in this he has no right. Why is the incomer in bondage? We do not bind old men in wanderers because they speak ill words when distraught. This one is imprisoned because of his assault upon Hardang, and Hardang cannot judge his own cause, but must bring his grievance to the judgment of the folk. Struck out, and some other must sit in the chair at the hearing. Yeah, we'll get there. Meanwhile, he cannot deny to the prisoner all counsel and help. If he were wise, he would see that he does not in, he does not in this way advance his own cause. But maybe another mouth spoke for him? True, they said. Avronk brought the order. Then forget it, said Manthor, for Avronk was under other orders to remain on his duty on the marshes. Choose then between a young renegade and the laws of the folk. Then the guards led him into the cave, for Manthor was well esteemed in Brethil, and men did not like the masters, changed to chieftains, who tried to overrule the folk. Um, okay, um... 
JJ, you don't think we should reenact the folk? Well, I don't, I don't think we should reenact the stool chucking for sure. That would not make a good reenactment. Um, anyway, okay. Notice how we have through Manthor, we get this glimpse into, he's giving us, he's not only showing us what the culture of the men of Brethel is. He is giving us a before and after. We're meeting the men of Brethel after they're already changing. It would be like seeing Bag End for the first time in the scouring of the Shire almost, right? Except we're also getting, you know, Menthor is the representative of and spokesman for the old ways, the traditional ways of the men of Brethil. Um, and their laws and customs. He's wise in the laws and customs of his people. And through him, we learn a very great deal about the laws and customs of his people. Right? And that's fun. Notice how it's, it is, it is like, going back to, yes, it is like that, um, how first we get the narrator, such was the shadow, right? But not all hearts were yet darkened. Shame upon you, cried Menthor the captain, right? So Menthor comes in, um, so first the narrator prompts us to, by saying such was the shadow as the power spread and fear walked far and wide, um, that these things are darkening the hearts of men, right? The hearts of men are becoming darkened by these things. And by saying this, the narrator has emphasized this is not the norm. This is not what the men of Bretho are like. This is like them. This is like the party tree after you know, this is like the field after the party tree has been cut down, right? This is not what the Shire is supposed to look like. This is not what the men of Breath Hill are. Don't judge the men of Breath Hill. Um, either, um, not only don't judge them by horrible avranc, but don't judge them even by timorous forehand, right? Um Men's hearts are darkened, but not all of them are. And so Manthor, we, in Manthor, we get this um, uh, spokesperson, right? This representative of how things were and clearly how the Haladin should be. And this helps to emphasize when we're meeting Hardang and Avrunk and watching them act, this helps, to, helps us to understand clearly... Um, what is normative and what is not normative in their views, right? We can see them, sorry, we can see them as a contrast, right? As a point of contrast to, um, you know, the, the, their culture is in decline. The men of hearts is being, is being darkened. They are the new breed of people. This is the direction in which things are trending in Beleriand, right? But there are places where the old ways are still recalled. Um, Alyssa, he does, uh, it's just a, Manthor always struck me as a cross between Boromir and Faramir. Boromir's ambition, but Faramir's living memory of older ways. He does have some of both. Um, uh, he, um, strikes me as very Faramir-like. Notice how in control Manthor is all the way through. No matter how horrible, no matter how, he never stoops, well, Reaching out in the passages, I mean, he he doesn't stoop to their methods. He he could become outraged, right? He could start punching folks, um, and he'd be sort of justified in a sense to. But no, he just Mantho knows he has right on his side, and he's going to stand on that right, right? Um, and notice how he appeals. He is appealing against the Lord, right? Against the Halad against the chieftain. He is calling out the chieftain, right? Not challenging him. Um, but he is uh, criticizing him. Um, Hardung has no... The lord, the, the warden, the halad, has no legal ground here. Right? I mean, he comes to the guards... Not with like the power of his personality, not with uh, the power of his fists, um, but merely to say, "I have um, uh, let us have a, a talk about the rights and wrongs of the situation." 
um, I have the law on my side, our laws and our customs. Our customs of, you know, treating people with respect, of not imprisoning guests as soon as they arrive, um, of not insulting them until they feel like throwing stools at our faces uh, as soon as they arrive, and then imprisoning them illegally afterwards, right? Um, and, of course, notice how he does not even... Um, having given an overt criticism of Hardung's proceeding, Hardung cannot judge his own cause, but must bring his grievance to the judgment of the folk. Because the folk... The laws and the folk are more powerful than Hardang, are greater than Hardang, right? Hardang is doing wrong. He cannot deny to the prisoner all, all counsel and help. So if you're telling me that he has said he cannot, um, you know, you're denying him his right to an attorney, um, then clearly our Lord is wrong. But notice what he does then. He then gives him the benefit of the doubt. But maybe another mouth spoke for him. Maybe, maybe we can't really blame Hardang himself for this. Perhaps it's someone else who's breaking the law. Oh, look, it's Avronk. Of course it is. Well, as Avronk's captain, I will tell you that I ordered him to remain on the marches, and he defied my orders. So, choose then. Notice how he immediately uses that opportunity to make the choice not between him and Hardang. That's kind of what's lurking behind all of it. Right? Um, are you going to follow me and my, you know, reliance upon, and, and the laws and customs of our people? Are you going to follow, are you going to join me in following our old ways? Or are you going to follow in the new ways of Hardang? It's Manthor versus Hardang all day long, right? But Manthor doesn't, part of being Manthor is not to say that, right? If he put himself up, against Hardang here, if he were bad-mouthing Hardang um, and saying you should follow me instead of him because he's a crappy leader, then that would put him down on Hardang's level. Mm -hmm. Instead, the choice is only between a young runagate and the laws of the folk. Um, and uh, that is a just a beautiful way of kind of turning this conversation. And they're like, yep. but And notice how the narrator tells us how this resonates with them. They're, they were obedient. They were doing what they probably suspected to be wrong out of fear because they were commanded by the Halad through Avrank, who is looking more and more worm tongueish as we go along. Um, but notice, Monthor was well esteemed in Brethil, and men did not like the chieftains who tried to overrule the folk. One of the ways in which the shadow that is lying now upon the hearts of men uh, in these evil days, one of the ways in which that's manifesting itself, apparently, in Brethil, is more and more of a trend towards dictatorial leadership. Um, apparently, they rule themselves, like the judgment of the folk, right? They are a democracy in Brethil. It's the will of the people that matters. The leader is not an absolute, does not have absolute authority over the people. Um, and chieftains who try to overrule the folk, that's new. And those are symptoms of these new times. Um, we see that it, it beginning to kind of like boil down to that, right? Okay, well, um, we'll get to the courtroom scene. We're almost there. We'll look at the courtroom scene and uh, continue through. Maybe we'll finish up the Wanderings of Huron for next time. Continue as as you review the end of the Wanderings of Huron. I don't think we're going to get further than the Wanderings of Huron. Um, I might be surprised. So you could go on a, a little bit in the next section if you want, but... Um, uh, but I doubt we'll get further than the end of the Wanderings of Hurin. Um, as we as you review that for next time, continue thinking about my why question. Why? What? What's happening here? What is the relationship between this and the Turin story? Why, when he finished the Turin story, did he feel he had so much else, so much else to say? Why does he want to do 
what is looking like it's going to be a full novel length, you know, Children of Hurin length story about Hurin, um, which is in itself is kind of a, a, an odd thing. Right. I'm going to tell the story of Turin Turambar. And then in the sequel, I'm going to tell about his dad, his geriatric dad. Like normally it works the other way around. Right. The Hurin story would be the prequel to the Turin story. But ironically and kind of horribly, it's not. Right. Um, it is going backwards a generation and looking at his aged father um, and looking at the ramifications. So this link to the older world and the newer world seems to be part of the whole premise of the thing, right? More. What What more do we see there? What does... What is the story that Tolkien seems to be trying to tell? Exactly, JJ. The sequel would be called The Father of the Children of Hurin. <laughs> yes. I like that title. That's good. The Father of the Children of Hurin. Okay. Anyway. All right. I got to let you go. Uh, keep in mind, uh, keep in mind. I can't say keep in mind because I don't think I told you before. I'm not going to be here next week, so I'm I'm um, I'm traveling uh, or here over this next week. Um, I'll be on the road uh, still next Wednesday. Um, so, um, uh, so no class next week, but we'll be back the week after that. Um, all right, so see you guys in two weeks, and then we'll continue our discussion of the children of Hurin. Uh, thanks, everybody, and I will see you in a fortnight. Bye now.